on the outskirts of it, where it's the last series of events before Jesus goes to Jerusalem for his week and uh, his crucifixion. So it's just a series of events that are put together, just the whole chapter of Mark 10, those events. And last week, we looked at the young man who approached Jesus, and he was looking for spiritual guidance. He was looking for an answer as to what he could do to, to uh, inherit the kingdom, that what he could do in himself to be a spiritual great, as it were, and uh, he was an eager man, he was a good man, he, by all accounts, he was, a, he was full of good works, he was a moral man, but when Jesus challenged him to give away his possessions and transfer his trust uh, to Jesus, he walked away sad. He was not ready to transfer his trust that was in his wealth, in his possessions, in his personal goodness to Jesus. He was still trusting in his wealth and his personal goodness. And um, Jesus, his disciples, we're going to look at them this week. This week, this is the fallout from that event. Okay, so that was the event, and that needs to be in our mind's eye, the rich young ruler, if you know your Bibles. Um, and the fallout from that, Jesus' disciples saw this guy walk away, and they were shocked. The disciples were totally shocked. And we already know the story, some of us, so we're like, oh, I'm not shocked, you know, we get it. But if we can put our minds into the text and understand what the disciples are thinking, what we, if we're honest, commonly think, what the norm of the world thinks, that we'll, then we'll understand why the disciples were totally shocked at what happened in this guy walking away. See, they weren't expecting it at all. Jesus was calling people to follow him, wasn't he? And this guy would have been great. This guy would have been great. He was influential. Again, he was, he was young and healthy. He was wealthy. He was like the healthy, wealthy, wise guy, right? This guy had a great reputation. So this next scene, again, is the fallout from that. And Jesus has a conversation with his disciples about this guy going away and about what was wrong. And I hope that by the uh, end of studying their conversation, Jesus and his disciples will see what they might have seen and find the proper place of money for our hearts and find the proper place of trust in our hearts and not confuse the two because they often are confused. So Greg, if you'd come up please and read the text for us, that'd be a, a blessing. We're in Mark chapter 10, if you want to open your Bibles or look up at the screen, verse 23 through 31. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying amongst themselves, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it's impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and for the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in, age, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Thank you, Greg. Great. Let's uh, pray as we start looking at this text. Father, we thank you for the time that we get to spend looking at your word, and we do pray that you would sanctify it to our hearts, that you would separate um, this time in, in the sense, Lord, of, of freeing us from distraction, from, from internal disruptions, and that we would have a, a focus and a guidance from your Holy Spirit to, to discerning your word, and that we would have application by your grace, and that you would uh, overlook my inadequacy, and that you would 
just be gracious to us all this morning as, as we delve into this wonderful time, Lord, understanding more about um, trust in our hearts and where things should be in priority. In your name, Jesus, we pray and thank you for answers. Amen. So the proper place of money and, and trust. Jesus, in verse 23, looked around after this young man left and he then looks around and sees the response of his disciples. This is what he sees. So whenever Jesus is looking at something, there's, there's an intention. You know, he's not wondering what's going on and he's, he's looking around. What's he see? He says to his disciples how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God when he probably saw their faces. He probably saw their body language and he read what it was saying, right? Was, I don't know what the figure is, 80 something percent of, of language is a body language or something like that, right? But their, their language and their face and their body was probably saying, what just happened? Like he left? Uh, what happened? This rich young ruler uh, who approached Jesus, he approached with respect. He wanted to know what he needed to do to get to heaven. He did not come as an antagonist like they had seen many times before with the Pharisees or someone challenging him with a question about marriage and divorce, etc. But by the end of the conversation this man had with Jesus, he walked away and Jesus let him go away. You know, some of these disciples were fishermen. They were all collectors in one way or another. And when Jesus told the fishermen specifically, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men, they're like, wow, okay, this is amazing. Let's follow Jesus. And they left their nets. They followed him. They already knew. They, 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 they were, had a repentant heart and so on. But um, just think about that idea. They're fishers of men. They left their nets. They followed him. And if we are fishers of men, this guy, this rich young ruler, would have been a great catch. He would have been a great catch. You don't have a giant fish on the line and let it go, right? But apparently that's what Jesus was doing. Apparently he had this great fish, you know, that comes up and, and he's saying, I want to have eternal life. I want to follow you. Imagine someone comes up, you know, to the church and they're, I mean, they're driving the, the fastest, best car. They've got the suit. They've got the money. They're promising stuff. I've been, I've been promised money before, not, not anyone here, but like the church, like, hey, we'll give an amount of money, you know, but the person was fickle, you know, and, and doesn't have a walk with Jesus, and, and one day would confess him and, and then totally deny him and slander every believer around, there's just none of it, right, and it was just trying to use their means to get something they wanted to bolster their pride or their identity or, or whatever it was, right, and ultimately, this guy was trying to use his means to get something from God, eternal life. To get something from God, use his means to do so. And Jesus saw through it all, but the disciples didn't see through it all. It was hard for them to see it. This guy could have done a lot for the team. He was educated, unlike some of them, not all of them, the disciples. And sometimes you might be intimidated by someone who's more educated. Oh, they could be used by God. But me? No. No. I'm a high school dropout or something, you know, or, or someone who is influential in some other way. Oh man, if they got saved, they could be so used by God. But I, I don't really kind of just don't know anybody. I'm quiet, right? Or, or somebody else who's, who's just super wealthy. They could do a lot for the kingdom. But me, I don't have much to give. See, everything you want to see in a person join your organization, the headhunters out there or whatever it is, LinkedIn and et cetera, they, this guy would have been one of the top guys. He really would have been, this rich young ruler. He would have been a guy that they would say, you want him on your team, Jesus. You want him to represent your organization to the world because it's a good face for everybody. It's, it's really good. No, Jesus chose the misfits. He chose the outcasts. He chose the nobodies. He chose the rejects to build his kingdom. Very different, very different. But of course, we know why. Who's going to get the glory? And so, the same mentality happens to us all the time. You know, the same mentality they had, this same mentality, when they turned the children away, just a few stories prior in Mark 10. They turn the, ch the children or people bringing children to Jesus, and he says, no. Uh, they say, they're saying, no, don't bring them. You know, Jesus doesn't have time for little insignificant people like kids and 
Jesus says, oh, you guys, he really rebuked them. You guys do not understand the kingdom of God. You guys don't get it, you know? Of such is the kingdom. Bring them to me. Don't stop them from coming to me at all. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means even enter it. The mindset is so prevalent. And, and sometimes, you know, we think, can think that way. And that is how the world thinks. It's totally how the world thinks. The CEO mentality, all this other stuff, right? And Jesus, in this text, is about to flip all of that on its head. He's about to turn it all totally upside down. And it's hard for a prevailing mindset of the world to understand the paradoxes, some, to understand how this would be the reality in Jesus' kingdom. But he does. He flips it. All the influence, all the wealth, all the power really can work and often does against a person in the kingdom of God. Not for a person. It, it can work against a person, and that's stated in Romans as well. But when it comes to Jesus' kingdom, it's different. So he, he looked at his disciples to see and sees that they're trying to process these principles of Jesus' kingdom. And oftentimes they're like, oh, so many places, Jesus, why, were, why are you doing things that way? Right? They didn't understand why he would do that. Taking the cross, for example. Why would you ever do that? Right? They, they didn't understand his, his methods, his kingdom. And he tells them there was a fundamental problem with this young man in verse 23. How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Here is a fundamental problem that this young man had. There's something difficult and hard in his life for him to, that, that would pose a problem for him to overcome so that he could enter the kingdom of God. And whether it's riches or something else, there are things that could pose to be difficulties, walls, barriers, things that are difficult for people to overcome so that they might be able to enter the kingdom of God. Things that they trust in, things that are built up and important in their lives because it doesn't mean you have to be better than those things or have to have a lot of those things or have to be really good at this or that. It means actually you have to just be humble and not trust in those things which we're all prone to look to and to trust in. So verse 24 the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them. They were astonished. The idea is they were mentally stumbling over his words and what was going on. It's, it's hard for people with money, wealth, and position to enter the kingdom? What? They didn't understand that. And Jesus answers their unspoken question the second time in verse 24. Children... How hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. He says it with great emphasis. And I like at first, by the way, he calls them children. He calls them children. After having the contrast of children <clears throat> are those who enter the kingdom and the rich young ruler walking away and not entering the kingdom. What a contrast. And he calls them children. How hard it is. You don't have to understand everything either to enter the kingdom. You don't have to know every theological conundrum to enter the kingdom. You don't have to be a theologian to enter the kingdom. You can be like a child and trust in Jesus. And yes, we grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We grow in knowledge because we desire to know him. Knowing him is wonderful. Knowing about him is wonderful. It's just not knowing information. It's knowing the person of God. And the more you know him, the more you understand truth and reality. So he calls them children. And it's, it's hard for those who, key word, trust. Trust. Key word. Highlight it. Trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's a childlike quality that gets in. A childlike uh, quality of trust in your provider, not what you provide for yourself or have in and of yourself. Children are, are so prone to the, my dad's the greatest. My mom is wonderful. You know, where does food come from? My mom in the fridge or something, you know, like that's where it comes from <laughs> rather than I got to go get it. So the childlike quality of trust is essential, but trusting in ourself or in what we provide is a difficulty. It's not because he had wealth. It's not because he had wealth. It's the fundamental problem is, is where 
trust is. Where is trust? That's the fundamental problem. Where is trust? Because he was trusting in his wealth and his self. I like how it rhymes. Makes it easy to remember. The rich young ruler trusted in his wealth and his self. In verse 25, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. For those who are interested in interpretation on this one, there's, there's two different real big schools of thought, and it's the eye of the needle being a certain gate around Jerusalem, and it was difficult to get through that gate. And the other thought is that there's a lot of parables, and there are, of that day, that of, of literal an eye uh, of a needle and a camel going through it, or a caravan going through it, or a donkey going through it. There was different ones written in different places. <clears throat> so either way... The, the picture is the point. And it's, it's a common parable, <clears throat> whether it's the gate or a real needle or whatever. It's emphasizing Jesus' point. That's the point. The point is not what the eye of the needle was. The point is that it's really hard, really hard for a, a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is using that as, a, as an exclamation point, verse 25. In verse 26, it says, they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? It starts, by the way, with Jesus looking at them, their astonishment. It, their shock gets greater and greater and greater. And I don't know if, if Jesus was just having fun with that or he's just, like, just helping them. I, I find it amusing personally. But, uh, you know, maybe you've been in a situation like that. Shock gets greater and greater. Like, whoa, what? You know, um, it starts with Jesus looking at them and he sees the, the look on their face. He sees their body language. They have an emotional disturbance about him, them when the rich young ruler walks away sad. And they're like, you're letting him go? This is crazy. We want this guy. We need his help. We're like so poor, we're picking grain off the, th this guy could buy us lunch or something, you know, like this is great. We need money in this ministry or something and you're letting it go? And, you know, Jesus answers that their face contorts further. They're like, what? You know, the head starts to turn. And the word for astonished is in verse 24. We already looked at that. The, the second time he answers them, the disciples respond, or the, after the first time he answered them, they were astonished. And the word's thambeo, to be astonished, amazed, terrified, frightened, it's a common word. Jesus sees they don't get it. He emphasizes trust and the, and the camel through the eye of the needle parable there, highlighting his point. Now their jaws are open. They're, they're like, they're clearly disturbed because it says they were astonished beyond measure or greatly astonished. And this time the word in verse 26 in their second, res their third response really in verse 26 is different word. It's, ek, I don't know how to say that, ekplesio. It means to strike out, expel by a blow, to drive out or away, to cast off by a blow. There, it was a blow to their mental mental understanding. It was just a, a blow to their, their false reality. And they were, boom, what? To strike one out of self-possession. Whoa, it's, it's amazement. They were, in other words, our common vernacular, what do we say? They were floored. It floored me. And then we, we just keep describing how much it floored me, right? I was so floored by it. I, you know, if you're driving, you've got to pull over at this point, right? The idea is that they, they were staggering, they were mentally staggering. That's the idea over this, okay? And I think that uh, that's definitely happened to me at times. You know, when God changes your worldview, when God changes your self-view, when God gets to your heart and really reveals to you who you are as a child of God, for instance, I'm a child of God. I don't have to perform. There's such something called grace. Maybe you were bred in religiosity your whole life and then you find out there's grace and it staggers you in such a good way, right? It shakes you out of your self and those, those calloused, you know, critical walls that are something like that. It just, something that staggers you. Wow, Jesus is coming again and has a plan for mankind in the world. Prophecy always came to pass. Biblical prophecy, always. I remember being staggered when I found out that evolution was a hoax. You know, broad evolution, Darwinian evolution. 
I was staggered. I was like, what? There's evidence for a creation by God? And, and then I find more evidence and more evidence and more evidence. And now people look at me if I ever time and they're like, you're crazy. You're a nutcase, right? I've been staggered so many times by God. It's a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I pray it happens to us all. And, and I pray that, that God shakes us out of our comfort, shakes us out of those complacencies, shakes us out of apathy, shakes us out of these, for, for his, his love's sake, and, and puts a fire in our hearts, makes us alive and, and the things of God. And, and what that looks like for each person or whatever is, is different. I'm not asking just for an emotional show, but where God touches our hearts and, and changes things. Don't we often think that wealth and position and good works reveal success? Do you ever walk down the street or somewhere and then you see someone who seemingly has it all and you feel less, you feel little? Have you ever felt little around seemingly very successful people? You know, don't we get under the idea and impression that wealth and success must mean God is blessing? Aren't there a lot of false doctrines being proclaimed out there that health and wealth means God is blessing you? And if you don't have health and wealth, God is not blessing you. Apparently, they didn't read Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, or many of the other prophets, or, or the crucifixion. <laughs> you know, he died poor, naked. I, I mean, it's, not, it's just not biblical. And, and this isn't preaching against money. We all need to be poor. That's not the message. It's what we trust in. It's where our mindset is. It's just a thing of the world, and we'll get to that. But his word is so powerful. His word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It strikes to the heart. And his word ought to be striking to the heart. Now it's spiritually discerned. We need to pray, ask God, Lord, bless me as I read your word. And it doesn't every day when I read it. I read it every day, it strike the heart, but it, it speaks more and more. I used to think the Bible was some old book that didn't relate to Cameron and his life and modern times at all, at all. When I was 20, I did not believe in the Bible. I did not believe it related to me especially. And then I started reading things and I was like, whoa, it relates to me, but of course, I had to be spiritually awakened first. So I had to be born again and start understanding Scripture, and it just illuminated. And I, I, now I read obscure passages in the Old Testament, and I'm thrilled. You know, it's amazing how God speaks. It's wonderful, and, and I can't wait for him to continue doing so, and it's going to be that way, learning about him forever. And you can hear his word, and you can walk away, or you can receive that strike for the change and good of the soul. Who then can be saved, they ask. Who then can be saved? Great question. Great question. If, if I was a Southern Baptist preacher, I'd preach, that would be the message. Who can be saved? Three points. Now, I'm not going to do that. But anyways, uh, we talk a lot about that here. Who can be saved? The perception of most of the world is who can be saved? Well, um, if I do good things, I can be saved. Isn't that a common perception? If I've done well for myself and... I've tried to be good, then I, I should, God should accept me. I'm a, or I'm a good person. I'll get in, you know. It, it, you know, if it isn't anything I've done or what measure of success or goodness I've achieved, then how can a person be saved? You know, how can someone be saved? If this guy couldn't get in, put it, rephrase the question. If this guy, this rich young girl, couldn't get in, who then could be saved? I mean, this guy's great. He's obviously better than me, Peter's thinking. You know, I got, I got a lot of fights as a kid, Peter's thinking. <laughs> you know, Matthew, everybody hated Matthew. He's a tax collector. He's a friend of tax collectors. He, he had to associate with people that no one would associate with. He's thinking, this guy's better than me. If he can't get in, who can be saved? Any of these zealots? Anybody else? Right? You guys get the picture? You think if this guy who's all that can't get in, who can be saved? Or someone who has met that measure of the, what the world calls success and prosperity, if they can't get in, who then can be saved? Jesus responds, I love it. He looked at them. Again, he's looking at them. I, I don't know what his look must have been like. So wonderful, so piercing. With men, it is impossible, but not with God, for with God, all things are possible. What a beautiful conversation and lesson they're having here. With men, it's impossible. Here is a, here's a great principle. Man can't save himself. 
with men, it's impossible. There's nothing man can do to save themselves. It's impossible, impossibility, impossible. But with, not with God, for with God, all things are possible. God can do that. God can save. If there's something impossible for man to do, man can get to the moon. Man can develop all kinds of technology. Man can re recreate things, you know, make things, design things. Man can do a lot of things, build skyscrapers, whatever. Man can overcome some things, not all things. Man can't overcome death. No one is going to overcome death. Not going to happen. You can, you can, you know, freeze DNA or whatever they're trying to do and, you know, let's clone hearts and organs or whatever. They are not going to overcome death. It's not going to happen. Who can be saved from death? Who can be saved? Who can be, who can be cleansed from a guilty heart? Who can, who can get a heart that, that is now for totally forgiven, not only totally forgiven from sin, spiritual crime against a holy God with all have committed, not only cleansed from that and forgiven for that, but then imputed righteousness and holiness on top of it. Who can do that? No one. It's so impossible. It's such an impossibility, but not with God. God can do that and has done that in Jesus Christ, hasn't he? Man cannot in himself reach the glory of heaven. Impossible. Man cannot in himself through some religious effort become righteous. Impossible. For man through his efforts, through his good works, through his religion to clean away the guilt and enter God's kingdom. Impossible. But what is impossible with man is possible with God in Christ. Salvation became possible. How a sinner can become righteous. How me, how you can become righteous how I can become a child of God, forgiven and with a hope of eternal life possible in Jesus Christ. How a beggar can become rich spiritually. Anything man trusts in other than Christ will come short of proving the necessary forgiveness, holiness, righteousness needed to enter his kingdom. Anything man can try to do. It's all about where trust lies. It's, salvation is the gift of God in Christ Jesus. It's through faith in him. By his grace, we've been saved. That's it. That's salvation. And it's a, that is a shock to the world, to all of its thinking. It is a, a total shock to religiosity, to re world religions. It is a total shock to the power of self. It is a total shock to Eckhart Tolle or Oprah or any of that stuff. It is a total shock to New Ageism. It's a total, the gospel is a complete shock. To apply it to any of this stuff, any of the worldviews out there. It's a total shock. In Christ, there is salvation, and it's absolutely wonderfully provided. Absolutely provided. There is nothing like the salvation in Christ anywhere. It is impossible elsewise. Absolutely impossible. Where God who is the offended one would take the place of those guilty offenders and die for them and rise again. The sinless lamb of God, he took the punishment. It had to be someone without sin taking the punishment for those with sin. It had to be the person without, that, that offering without sin would, would not only take that, but then rise from the dead, providing a righteousness imputed. And here we're speaking about specifically wealth. It could be a mentality of any of these worldview areas. But riches in themselves are not good or evil, by the way. Money is just a thing. And the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, yes. But money in itself isn't evil. It's just a resource. It's just a, 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 something we use to make transactions with. It isn't evil. People can be evil. Spirits can be evil. A chair can't be evil. Money in itself can't be evil. A building can't be, right, etc. What it's used for, if it's been offered in a certain way or something like that, but it is a thing of this world. Money is. When you look at the face of money on the coins, etc., what do you see? They didn't have, you know, the paper bills in the ancient times, although they did have promissory notes, contracts. But they had coins. The Roman, Romans had a lot of coins, a lot of different coins. I was reading a list of them. It was huge. And it usually had the emperor on one side, the, the head of an emperor. On the reverse side, 
all kinds of symbols. They had all kinds of symbols of something military or some virtue, mostly virtues, they had on the other side of the coin. Really interesting, I think. But valor, standing full-armed. Happiness, crowned with poppies. Hope, stumbling a little and smiling on a flower bud. Security, leaning on a column. Abundance, emptying her cornucopia. They had modest, and they were all doing something. All these pictures, okay? Word pictures on the coin. Modesty, victory, piety. Honestly, all these things. And then, or they had gods. Neptune, Bacchus, Diane, Jove. All these false gods on the other side of the coin after the emperor on the one side. But none of these things, whether a government, a moral virtue, a false god, could save. How could they save? And people would end up putting their hope in these things. And it is the model of mankind, the emperor. We, we trust in the emperor. We trust in our country. We trust in this false god. We trust in this virtue. I trust that we have been pious. We have been virtuous. We have been moral. We have been this. We have been that. The Jews who worship the one true God, of course, forbid idolatry. And on the shekel, there were no heads, not allowed. On the shekel was the almond rod that, that budded, Aaron's rod, and on the other side, the pot of manna. And I think that's pretty cool because that speaks of God's blessing and provision to his people. And if I see money that way, the money that's I'm allowed to be a steward over temporarily because I won't take any of it with me. Rockefeller's accountant was asked when he died. Rockefeller died. Someone asked his accountant, how much did he leave behind? And the accountant said, well, everything. <laughs> so you can't take any. And the reality is I'm a temporary steward over certain resources. And, and do I see those resources as God's blessing and provision? Ultimately, they belong to him. They're, they're his blessing and provision. You know, but money ultimately is part of the world system we live in. You know what we call finances? Securities. Securities. We call them securities. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And we lock up our securities, passwords, safes, whatever. See, the problem is that with money is, is that it can become wealth, um, power, influence, these things can be a handicap. They can become a handicap for faith because you can trust in them as though they are a security in themselves for your soul. How can something that is material and temporary secure your soul? That doesn't make any sense. It's just a thing that's going to pass with the passing of the nations in this world. It's a foolish thing to trust in uncertain riches. 1 Timothy 6.17 Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives, giveth us uh, richly all things to enjoy. He's allowed us to have things to enjoy. Enjoy a nice dinner. Enjoy uh, one another's company. Enjoy, but... Do not trust in uncertain riches. We should know money is a false security. We should know that. But so are all those other ideas. Moralism is a false security. Peter responds in verse 28. Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Peter's like, I, I want to enter in. If we've left all and followed you. Leave it to Peter to speak up. And... and you know, we don't want any hindrances. And it's true, they did leave their businesses to follow Jesus. And Matthew likely being the wealthiest, by the way. Matthew was very wealthy. His position would have been worth a lot of money as a tax collector in Capernaum. He was, his position itself was worth a fortune, his government position, which someone else would then, would then have to purchase or get or what have you. I remember looking at that when in early stages of the Gospel of Mark. Matthew left a lot of wealth to follow, follow Jesus. Some of the other guys, not so much. I, I didn't really leave anything to follow Jesus. I didn't give up anything. Uh, <laughs> it was easy. Jesus affirms this, though. When Peter says, we've left all to follow you, Jesus affirms it in verse 29 to 31. Surely I say to you, there's no one who has left houses, 
or house or brothers or sisters, father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels. And by the way, those things are those material things, uh, th- whether it's a house or whatever, material, or, or it could be relational, relationships. Now, relationships are extremely important, but follow me in this here. Verse 30, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. I like that little qualifier, with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first, he says at the end there. There's going to be a reversal of order. Many who are first are going to be, many who appear to be first in this world are going to be last. Many who appear to be last in this world are going to be first. Think about Luke chapter 16. You can think about there's a rich man and he had so much at his table and there was a beggar named Lazarus and the beggar would eat the scraps off his table. They'd let the scraps come outside of the gate and give them to the beggar. Scraps, what we swept off the floor, give it to him. He ate the compost. That's the reality. And they both died. And the rich man is in Hades. And there's a great gulf between him and Abraham's bosom. Those who were trusting in the future of the Messiah would come. And that's where the beggar named Lazarus was. And the rich man ends up being the beggar, asking that he could just have sin Lazarus with a little bit of water or send Lazarus to my family to warn them to escape this place. The rich man becomes the beggar and Lazarus becomes the one who has the spiritual, the reality, the wealth, and is going to inherit the kingdom with its glory. So there's going to be a reversal of order. Most of the world's priorities don't have God first. They don't. God is either last in the world's priorities, typically, or he's Nowhere, (laughs) typically, nowhere, right? Uh, This doesn't mean, by the way, Jesus is calling everyone, everyone that follows me has to give up and leave everything. It's a matter of priority. It's a matter of where our hearts are at. And he calls some to specific ventures of faith that will require them to to leave a family member for some time or something else. It doesn't mean don't provide or anything like this or don't be responsible, Jesus isn't calling anyone to be irresponsible. Irresponsible, I think I said responsible earlier. Perhaps the most, by the way, responsible thing to do is what it says in Mark 8, 36. We were just in Mark 8. And and, and he says in Mark 8, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Mark 8, 36 says, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What's going to profit a person? If anything or anyone or whatever it is takes the place uh, of your heart where there's a throne, if anything else sits on that where he alone deserves that place of the throne of your heart, the king of my heart needs to be Jesus and should be alone Jesus, should be God. He alone deserves that place. And if anything else has that place, we're living in the wrong order. We've got things in the wrong order. You know, we use people we ignore God, we worship money, or we worship ourselves and love money. You can transfer those two. I either love myself and worship money, or I worship money and love myself. No, you need to worship God, you need to love people, you need to use money, things, material world, and you need to ignore, what's the last one? Self, ignore self. That's the right priority of things. Worship God, love people, use things, and ignore self. That's the right way to live. That's how God's designed us. And we'll be blessed if we live in that order. Jesus said also, no one can serve two masters. Either he loves the one or he hates the other, or hates the other and loves the first. You can't, you can't have two kings on your heart, right? There's gonna, it's a boxing ring. You need one there. It, money cannot be your God at the same time as Jesus, and what this is about is who or what is the master of your life? In Luke 9, 57 to 62, I'll read it to you in the NASB. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, are you really ready to follow me wherever I go? What if it costs you your house and land? What if it cost you a life like that to follow me? He said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me to first go and bury my father. 
But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. I've got to go take care of some family priorities. I've got to go do, deal with this. I've got to do that. And don't get it confused. We are to, to be reconciled with people before we go and worship God. We are to deal with things. But this is dealing, I've got to deal with the estate. I've got to go deal with my father's estate and go deal with those lands and go deal with all this stuff. And then I'll follow God. You know, Moses forsook the treasures of Egypt rather to partake with the suffering of the people of God. Moses was in line to be Pharaoh. He was not under Ramses. It's a wrong timeline. Moses was in line because there was no Pharaoh. He was the adopted son because the Pharaoh had two daughters and Nefertiti and another one. They, and she adopted um, Moses, drawn him out of the water. And Moses was in line. He was in line to be commander over Egypt, Pharaoh. And he forsook the treasures of Egypt, the absolute glory and pinnacle of this world, to rather suffer affliction with the people of God. He had his priorities straight. And then he says this in, in Luke um, 9, 61. Another has also said, I will follow you, Lord, but permit me first to go say goodbye to those at home. And Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus is serious. Jesus, his mission is serious and he would obey one will, the will of the Father. He would obey the will of the Father. Now the Father's will is never for us to be unloving, Right? unfaithful and so forth. That's never the Father's will. And yet the, he, he knew his job because he obeyed the will of the Father. I only do that which pleases the Father. He had his mission. So all of the contradictory agendas that come at us, all of the, the information that's coming at us saying, you know, you should go do this with your life. You should go do that with your life. I need to go do this with my day or whatever. They're competing ideas against the pursuit of Jesus, against the will of God for my life. All these competing influences for what I should do. But just put first thing first, and that's where it starts. Exodus 20, verse three says, this is the 10, ten Commandments, the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And all other gods would be false gods. No, there's no other God but the Lord alone. And, and Jesus gives this well, Peter says we've left all. And then what does Jesus say? He actually is giving assurance and promises. He's actually blessing Peter's um, confession that Peter did choose to leave those things, leaving it and to follow. And Peter, we'll see, you can see later in the epistles, Peter did take on his, his wife, was with him in the ministry, by the way. It's in the epistles. But um, it says here in verse 29 and 30, Jesus is giving those promises you are truly blessed both current blessings and eternal blessings there's no one who hasn't left that won't inherit a hundredfold he says whether it's houses or lands or what you know oh if i give i'll get if i really let it go then god will give me more that's selfish right you can't play god you know you can't you can't try to manipulate god so you can get what you ultimately want selfishly that's not how it works Worship God, love him, serve him. And all those things you need will be added to you. Mark, you know, Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God's righteousness. All these things you need in life, God knows what you need. He's not gonna give you something sour. He's not gonna give you something bad. He's not gonna give you something horrible that you don't need. You know, his kids ask for things and he blesses. He gives what we need. But sometimes what we think we need and what we really need are different things, by the way, Right? But when God is on the throne of our lives and Jesus is foremost, we are truly blessed. Material things won't hold the power over our hearts that they previously did. And if I lose that material thing, I'm not, my world isn't shattered. You know? You can take a toy from a kid and they think the world's over. Ah, the monster comes out, right? What about me as an adult? Can, is something going to taken from me and I, I, am, I lose it? All my security's gone. What if the EMP hit and the world, you know, and like all the electronic money's delete? You know, like, ah! you know it's like, what, what do we do? Where is my heart? Where's my soul? Where's my security? Where's, what's holding my affection? 
you know, because he says you get these things and persecutions. Now, I did lose job opportunity. I got fired for being a Christian at one point. And, um, you know, I've lost opportunities. I, I, I lost career prospects. I, I, I made the choice to serve God. And, but what is that, you know, whatever I have, might have lost in this world, I live in a beautiful city and et cetera, but what is that compared to the treasures of his kingdom? What is it? And if any one of us had such need, we are the body of Christ where we supply one another's lack. That's where you receive a hundredfold houses and lands. Jesus didn't have a house. He didn't have a home. This guy's a carpenter, right? He should have a house. He didn't have one. But he was in Mary and Martha's house. He, w- he would go and, and he was in a house apparently down in Judea as well. Like there were, there were places that would receive him. And Mikasa Sukasa, right? Sukasa. My house is your house, right? Hebrews 10, 34 to 35 And the CSB says this, For you sympathized with the prisoners and accepted with joy the confiscation of your possessions because you know that you yourselves have a better and enduring possession. So don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Keep your mind on the prize. Keep your eyes up there. And and these guys were happy to lose their stuff. Whoever the writer of Hebrews is speaking to, these Hebrews, that they were happy to lose their stuff because they were receiving a treasure that doesn't fade away, They're an imperishable treasure. The believers apparently in this situation, we don't know the details, but they faced a situation where they had to lose all their possessions or walk away from their faith. They, they knew they couldn't keep it anyways, though. They gave it up gladly, it says in Hebrews 10, 34. They gave it up gladly, happily giving up, knowing that they have an eternal possession it far outweighs the perceived losses far outweighs anyone that could do the math what profit that's a, a, a financial term profit is it if a man gains another financial term the whole world and loses another financial term is soul what profit is it what kind of a that's a stupid exchange never do that bad 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 deal bad deal so they gave it up gladly knowing the real deal. We find peace we could never have before in Christ. What blessings? Because those things could never give me the things that the commercials told me it would give me. Right? Commercials. Don't you love them? What a bunch of liars. You know? Like if you, if you use this toothpaste, your teeth will look as good as mine. You know, ding! I'm like, didn't work, you know, or whatever it is. If you do this, you will have this. You will have a, you will have identity. You'll have confidence. You'll, you know, and what is with like some of the, you know, uh, commercials, like, especially if there's an alcohol commercial, something like that. So what a lie. What a lie. Yo, you'll be, ha- you'll have so much fun. You know, you'll ruin your life. <laughs> there's the alley side of it, right? Go to East Hastings or whatever. Um, but those things don't sell if they tell the truth. So, we need to see the reality. And we get peace. We get joy. We get, we get love, to have love, to be loved, to receive and give love in Christ. I mean, things the world can't give you. Things that can't be taken away from you, hope. When you're brought into the body of Christ, you have a family. You have, and I hope that we behave like a family. There should be generosity amongst us. And I've experienced generosity from you. And I hope that there's generosity that goes all around in the body of Christ. We, we are in a f- true family. We're in the body of Christ, and he's the head of that family. I lost friends when I came to Christ as well. I did. They thought I joined a cult. They, they, some of them thought, this is crazy. I felt like I was going to lose um, one of my brothers specifically, who I dearly, dearly love, and I did for a time. It was like I lost him, and, and we were so close. And um, he came to Christ a year and a half later, and the first time I was asked to speak, I got about two words out, three words, four words, and I just started bawling because my brother got saved. And I was just so thrilled that he got saved, right? And it's like I gained him back and so much more now, right? I gained, I have my brother back and he's alive and in the Lord. And I have brothers and sisters here. We're, we're the family of God. And when we meet other believers elsewhere that trust in Jesus Christ, we're the family of God. And that's how it is with his family. We're all of the family of the firstborn of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 21 to 23 says this. So let no one boast in men. 
for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the word or life or death. We have victory over death. Life is ours. Or the present or the future. All are yours. What is this talking about? And you are Christ's and Christ is God's. Is Christ the king? Is he the coming king who is going to rightfully inherit all that truly belongs to him that's been usurped by his enemies? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm in Christ and I'm a joint heir with him and I, I am going to inherit the kingdom with my Savior Jesus Christ who is Lord of lords and he is the king over all kings. Yes. And you are all those in Christ. So guess what? The reality is there's a hierarchy. God, Christ, his church, everything else. His bride, right? We are in him. So ultimately are not all things ours. Temporarily, we don't see that. But eventually that is going to be it. And if you're faithful with little, you'll be faithful over much. And if you're faithful over 10 things, you'll be ruler over 10 cities, it says. Like God has a plan and a future. And this is why the disciples would ask, let me sit at the right hand, let me sit at the left. They had a vision for his kingdom. They knew some of the prophecies. And they knew the reality of it. They believed. Faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the, uh, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's a reality and it's coming. This world cannot sustain itself the way it's going. Either a war or some other cataclysmic, you know, environmental thing, it is not going to keep going. <laughs> like, and the Bible tells us clearly what's going to happen. All things are ours in Christ. So what's a big deal if I temporarily let go of something that held in my heart? I can definitely tell you this. Jesus calls you to follow him. He may call you to give up one thing or another, but you know what? He's not in looking for influential people. He's, not, he's looking for people who are willing to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Jesus doesn't call you because of anything in and of you. By the way, that's both humbling and wonderful. Did you know that it's humbling and absolutely freeing and wonderful? That he calls you not because of it's anything in you? It humbles, it's humbling you because our pride then isn't allowed to take credit for any reason God would call us. That's, that's humbling. But it's so freeing. It's so freeing and it's so wonderful because no matter who I am in all my failures, I am so loved and he calls me to be part of his kingdom. And he has a mission for me. He has life and purpose, identity for me. This is so wonderful. He accepts us because of who he is, not because of who I am and what I have or have not done. How good I've been or how bad I've been. And when we see his majesty and we see his love, it's so compelling. And the love of Christ compels us. I, I can't give up anything because I feel... I'm convicted and compelled. You know, I want to be more holy. When the love of God works into the heart, then it, you can freely release things you could never release before. Maybe you're bitter at somebody, right? For example, and you can't forgive and release that psychological debt. But knowing the love of Christ for you brings mercy into the heart that provides love to be able to forgive that, right? There's, there's, a, there's a knowledge of God and knowledge of Christ that is so freeing that it tells me he is better than anything in this world. Nothing compares to him. And now I know where true value is and perceived value is. Perceived value. So what holds our hearts today? Let me have the guys come up and, and worship. We're gonna have communion. Where is your security and your trust? And, and is there anything on the throne of my heart? No, it's you alone, Jesus. May you take that rightful place that you so deserve. And as we worship the Lord and we take the elements, just meditate upon that. And, and if there needs to be any forgiveness that you ask the Lord for, you know, forgive me for uh, the worship uh, of, or the trusting in, in anything of self, money, wealth, success, influence. I desire that for my identity. Lord, I forgive me for that. I want to turn my heart and worship you alone and trust in you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you love us so much and that you're for us. So who can be against us? And we thank you that you can help us to make uh, 
use of money for your kingdom and not allow it to rule our hearts. Jesus, we thank you that we want to have you enthroned in the first place. We want to worship you. You're so worthy, God. We give you praise and we love you and we thank you. Would you please take that priority of, uh, in our hearts? Take the throne, be seated there, be at peace there, and, and wash our lives with your word. Work through our lives in your word, God. Thank you for sweet surrender and thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name. Let me stand together. And uh, as these guys start to play, go ahead. There's two tables in the back here. And uh, we'll, we'll have communion together.